Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the anti-rheumatoid drugs. Okay, so in this video what we're going to turn our attention to is a bunch of drugs that are classified under the umbrella title Disease Modifying Anti-Rheumatoid Drugs. Okay, and this is a strange collection of drugs. This is a bunch of drugs that didn't really fit into any of the other things that we looked at. So we looked, remember, at anti-inflammatory drugs where we saw the uh, the NZs, we saw the, um, the anti-cytokine drugs. We then looked at the uh, glucocorticoids, which were both anti-inflammatories and immunosuppressants. And we then looked at the immunosuppressants. Now, the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs basically is everything that's left over. And quite a few of these drugs, we don't actually know how they work, or we have a very putative idea of how they work. Okay, so... I'm going to give you the five major examples of the drugs in this category, and then we'll go through them one by one, and I'll tell you as much as is known, basically, about their mechanism. Okay, so disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, and these things are often abbreviated to DMARDs for short, so D for disease, M for modifying, AR for anti-rheumatic, and DS for drugs, so DMARDs. Right, okay, so the five major drugs that are within this category are mefotrexate, and this really is the first choice treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. So this is a very important drug, mefotrexate. Uh, it's also used as an anti-cancer chemotherapy, and it's going to achieve its effect in rheumatoid arthritis by an immunosuppressive action. In fact, it's very similar to azathioprine and um, mycophenolate, except that it's not really specific at all uh, for the T and B lymphocytes. Okay, now it isn't usually counted as an immunosuppressant. If anything, it will be considered a uh, anti-cancer chemotherapy drug, but it is a disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug. Okay, so next drug up, and I think I'll put the, go along like this. Next one is a drug known as sulfazalazine. Okay, so sulfazalazine. Okay, now this is again a very effective drug in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, the mechanism of it isn't really known. We'll look at a putative mechanism of it. However, the ideas that we have so far about how this works, none of them have got anyone very convinced, basically. It doesn't seem to be a powerful enough mechanism, almost. Okay, so we'll talk about sulfazalazine. Uh, and then the next one is a drug known as penicillamine. Okay, so penicillamine is another disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug. Uh, then you have a bunch of drugs that are all classified as gold compounds, and we'll discuss these. Okay, and then finally, you have the anti-malarial drug, uh, chloroquine. Okay, and the mechanism by which chloroquine... Um, works to treat malaria is very putative. Um, the mechanism by which chloroquine works to treat rheumatoid arthritis is even more so. We have no clue, basically. Okay, so, uh, we will start with methotrexate, which is very nicely characterised. We know how methotrexate works, we know what that does, and it's also the first choice treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, and we'll then work through them in order. Okay, so we'll start off with methotrexate. So methotrexate is again going to work uh, by producing immunosuppression. It stops cell division. Now, it's going to stop cell division in all cells in your body, basically, not just the B and T lymphocytes. But it will stop cell division in the B and T lymphocytes, and therefore it will do the same thing as azathioprine and mycophenolate and kill the adaptive immune response. Now, it's actually even more powerful than azathioprine and mycophenolate, because not only is it going to uh, stop the production of adaptive immune system cells, but it's also going to stop the production of the innate immune system cells. So, for instance, the neutrophils and the macrophages, uh, well, the monocytes, which were involved in the... Um, rheumatoid arthritis pathology as well, it will also stop their production because in order to produce those cells, 
and you need um, cell division that's occurring within the bone marrow basically. So you're also going to stop the production of neutrophils and monocytes and remember those monocytes were responsible for differentiating into macrophages, dendritic cells and osteoclasts. Okay, so by stopping the production of macrophages and dendritic cells you hugely reduce the inflammatory response. Also you stop the uh, presentation of antigens to the T-cells in the first place and also by stopping the osteoclasts you're going to stop um, this bone degradation that occurs in chronic rheumatoid arthritis. Okay so this is going to be a very very powerful drug basically. So how does it stop cell division? Well basically it's going to inhibit an enzyme Okay, so methotrexate is going to inhibit an enzyme that is within cells, which is called dihydrofolate reductase. So it inhibits the enzyme DHFR, okay, and this stands for dihydrofolate reductase. Okay, now, this enzyme is responsible for producing tetrahydrofolate from uh, folic acid, okay? So it performs two conversions. So this enzyme, dihydrofolate reductase, is converting folic acid, okay? Which is also known as folate. Again, folic acid is the actual acid. Folate is the conjugate base of folic acid. But of course, in any solution, you'll have both, so you can use them interchangeably. And this is also known as vitamin B9. Okay, and it's going to convert folic acid or folate or vitamin B9 into, firstly, dihydrofolate. So dihydrofolate is the first thing that we're going to produce. And dihydrofolate is often abbreviated to DHF for short. Okay, so this conversion is carried out by dihydrofolate reductase. Dihydrofolate will then be converted to tetrahydrofolate, and it's all done by the same enzyme. So tetrahydrofolate comes next, and that's not going to fit in, so on to the next page. Well, on to the next line, rather. So tetrahydrofolate is abbreviated to THF for short. So dihydrofolate firstly converts uh, folic acid or vitamin B9 or folate into dihydrofolate and then dihydrofolate is converted again by the same enzyme into tetrahydrofolate. Now, tetrahydrofolate is then converted further, not by this enzyme, uh, into uh, something known as N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate. Okay, so N 5 N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate. Okay, so N5 N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate. Okay, um, and basically what's now going to happen is this N5 N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate is going to be used in the synthesis of thymidine monophosphate. Okay, which remember is then going to be necessary to produce uh, thymidine triphosphate, which remember is this deoxynucleoside triphosphate, which will be necessary for the construction of DNA. Okay, so in order to make N5 N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate, you need this enzyme dihydrofolate reductase DHFR to work. Okay, now let's have a look at this conversion. Basically, what happens? is N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate is going to be converted back to dihydrofolate reductase. And when you do that, what you will also do concurrently is you will turn a molecule of deoxyuridine monophosphate. Okay, so understand what this means. Remember, deoxyuridine means uracil, the organic base uracil bound to deoxyribose. And then monophosphate means uh, a single phosphate group added on there. So let me just draw a cartoon of this out. Okay, so here is the ribose, well, sorry, the deoxyribose sugar this is. Okay, and then you've got uracil. So this is deoxyuridine monophosphate. So I'll write out its full name. So deoxyuridine means uh, deoxyribose bound to the organic base uracil. 
and then monophosphate tells you that there is a single phosphate group stuck off that uh, fifth carbon of the deoxyribose sugar. Okay, and now what's going to happen is when you convert N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate back into dihydrofolate, you get the necessary pieces from the N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate that you need to convert this organic base from uracil to thymine. Okay, so let me show this happening. So, here again we have a phosphate group of deoxyribose sugar, so that hasn't changed at all. All that has changed is the organic base, you now have thymine there, basically. Now, remember, there was a funny name for the thymine um, nucleoside, remember? Uh, so, when you had thymine, well, sorry, the thymine deoxynucleoside, uh, so when you had thymine bound to deoxyribose, um, that was just called thymidine, it was not called deoxythymidine, although some people do call it deoxythymidine. But what's important to understand is thymidine does not, repeat, does not mean thymine bound to ribose. It means thymine bound to deoxyribose. So this means thymine bound to deoxyribose, which we have here. And then it's monophosphate, because you have a single phosphate group on there. So this is a deoxy uh, nucleoside monophosphate, even though it doesn't look like one. Okay, so this will be called TMP for short. So, which enzyme catalyzes this? Well, in order to understand the name of this enzyme, you also need to know that there is another name for thymidine monophosphate. Okay? And this is why I hate this branch of biochemistry so much, because there's just so many names for loads, so many different things, okay? So thymidine monophosphate also has another name, and its other name is thymidylate. Okay, so thymidylate. Now, is that an I or... Yes, I think it's an I there rather than a Y. I was just debating whether that was a Y there. Uh, no, you wouldn't have three Ys in the same word. So thymidylate. Okay, so thymidine monophosphate is all called thymidylate. Okay, so that makes the name of this enzyme make sense because the name of this enzyme is going to be thymidylate uh, synthase or synthetase it is. Okay, so thymidylate synthetase, uh, which converts deoxyuridine monophosphate into um, thymidine monophosphate, also called thymidylate. Now, thymidine monophosphate, you can stick two more phosphate groups on there and get thymidine triphosphate, which is thymine bound to deoxyribose with three phosphates, and that organic well, that's nucleotide, that deoxynucleotide, more strictly, uh, is necessary for the construction of a DNA strand. Okay, so, uh, you might ask, well, do we also need this uh, to make the uh, deox uh, sorry, the ri normal ribose form? But, of course, you have to remember that this organic base thymine is not used in RNA, okay? So, this is only necessary for the production of DNA. Okay, so... In order to make the thymidine triphosphate, which is the deoxy uh, nucleoside triphosphate uh, that you need to make DNA, okay, so it's one of the four that you need to make DNA, um, you need this reaction to occur. You need uh, deoxyuridine monophosphate to be converted into thymidine monophosphate. And in order for that to occur, thymidylate synthetase needs N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate as a substrate, which it can convert back to dihydrofolate. Now, if you have given the drug methotrexate, which inhibits this enzyme, dihydrofolate reductase, then you block that step there. That's gone. So, your dihydrofolate will just build up and up and up, and your N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate will go down and down and down, and therefore thymidylate synthetase will run out of this N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate, and therefore it will stop converting deoxyuridine monophosphate into uh, thymidine monophosphate. Therefore, you're not going to be able to produce any thymidine triphosphate, which is necessary for DNA replicate, well, necessary for building new DNA strands, of which therefore is necessary for DNA replication. Okay, so DNA replication is going to be stopped by this, and therefore the cell is not going to be able to divide. 
Now, this is the archetypal mechanism that you is given for methotrexate. Um, okay, so the archetypal example that's given is that thymidylate synthetase requires this N5, N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate and therefore requires the function of this enzyme. But in actual fact, you need um, the production of tetrahydrofolate by this enzyme uh, for many other uh, processes within the cell. Specifically, you need it for synthesizing a lot of the other uh, organic bases as well. So, uh, methotrexate does not just block DNA synthesis, it also blocks uh, RNA synthesis as well, for instance, because some of the other organic bases, their synthesis will be uh, affected by this. Although this is the archetypal example that is given, this is the best characterized of them. Okay, so you're going to stop uh, producing this thymidine monophosphate and you can see how that uh, would stop DNA replication. It's less obvious why that would cause a stop in um, RNA production because thymidine, you know, thymine isn't needed for RNA. Uh, but the reason that it also stops the production of RNA is that tetrahydrofolate is needed for the synthesis of uh, other organic bases too, which are in RNA. Okay, so methotrexate is therefore going to stop cell division and that's going to produce immunosuppression. And also, more than that, it's going to uh, produce, um, downregulate the cells involved in the inflammatory response as well. Okay, so that's methotrexate. Now let's move our attention to this next drug along, which is sulfazalazine. Okay, so sulfazalazine. The mechanism of sulfazalazine is not very well understood. So, what I'm going to talk about instead is the structure of sulfazalazine and also its bioavailability. Okay, and then we will look at a putative mechanism for how it works, which doesn't really have that much weight behind it. Okay, so the official position really is that the mechanism of sulfazalazine is not known. Okay, so let me show you the structure of the drug sulfazalazine. Okay, so it has a six-membered ring here known as a pyridine ring. So we've seen pyrimidine rings. Now, pyridine ring basically is very similar. It's a similar concept that you take a benzene ring and you modify that benzene ring by taking one of the carbons out and replacing it with nitrogen. Okay, but you only take one carbon out this time. Remember, in the pyrimidine ring, you took out two. So that's a pyridine ring there, and I'll just write that down. Okay, now, sulfazalazine is not just a pyridine ring. It's going to have other things added onto it. So you're also going to have a nitrogen coming off here, which will have a hydrogen coming up there. Then you'll have a sulfur atom down here, and this will have two... Uh, oxygens coming off it which are both doubly bonded to it and then up here you'll have a benzene ring attached here so I'll put this here okay uh, so we need alternating double and single bonds and then finally over here you then have a ni two nitrogens like so and then they are bond uh, they're bound rather uh, to another benzene ring like so uh, which has a carboxylic acid group coming off it and an alcohol group coming off it and some of you might well recognize this structure here so when you've got a carboxylic acid group coming off a benzene ring and an alcohol group coming off a benzene ring that's the structure of salicylic acid okay it's the structure that aspirin which is acetyl salicylic acid is based on okay right so this is the drug of sulfasalazine now, basically the drug is taken orally and what happens is in the intestine it is broken down into two separate drugs. So let me see the, well, two separate products. So let me show these products. Okay, so the first and the one that is believed to be the active member, okay, at least as far as the putative mechanism of this drug is concerned, okay, is what's known as 5-amino salicylic acid. So, we have our benzene ring here, we have our carboxylic acid group coming off here, 
And I realise that this is kind of a deformed skeletal structure that I've shown the carboxylic acid group uh, non-skeletally, i.e. its molecular structure. And I've done that because carboxylic acid groups, they actually look scarier if you show them in the skeletal formula. Uh, they look nicer when you show them in their molecular formula. Whereas benzene rings, they look scarier if you show them in their molecular way. So it's all about just trying to make things look nicer, basically, rather than sticking to rules rigorously. Okay, so this drug that we have here is 5-amino salicylic acid, okay? So, if you didn't have the amino group on there, whoops, not cyclic acid, salicylic acid. If you didn't have the amino group on here, that would just be salicylic acid. Now, the carbons in salicylic acid, in the benzene ring of salicylic acid, are numbered as follows. So, the carbon which has the carboxylic acid off is 1. The carbon with the alcohol group is 2, this carbon is 3, this carbon is 4, and this carbon here is 5. So that's the logic of the name, that's the logic in this being 5-amino salicylic acid because the amino group is coming off the fifth carbon. Okay, now, the other product of the breakdown is what's left, okay? So, here is this pyridine ring here, okay, so the six-membered ring where you have alternating double and single bonds and a single nitrogen here. Okay, and then off here we still have this nitrogen up here with this hydrogen, and then this sulfur down here with two oxygens coming off it that are double bound to it, and then the benzene ring here. Okay, now, what does it have coming off the benzene ring? What's well, going to have an amino group? So off here, there's going to be an amino group. Okay, so what's the name for that molecule? Well, the name for that molecule is sulfapyridine, which is an actually uh, used as an antibacterial drug. Okay, so this is sulfapyridine, or sulfapyridine, rather. Um, so uh, it's called that clearly because it's based on the pyridine ring. Right, so in the uh, colon, what happens is the sulfasalazine molecule is broken down into 5-amino salicylic acid and sulfapyridine. Okay, and the oral, well, the absorption of these drugs from the intestine is extremely pure, uh, is extremely poor, okay? Uh, so the oral bioavailability of sulfazalazine is very, very poor, okay? Uh, now, it also has another me sorry, it also has another use. It is actually used to treat inflammatory bowel disease, so Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And it's more obvious, therefore, how it can be used to treat those, because if it's all remaining in the gut, pretty much, then it's uh, clear to see how it can actually access the gut. Whereas how it actually, you know, gets into the blood in a high enough form to have any effect on the synovial joints isn't really understood. Okay, but we do think that there is a potential uh, mechanism uh, with regards to 5-amino salicylic acid, because 5-amino salicylic acid is very good at scavenging uh, free radicals. Now, in the chronic synovitis that you get in uh, rheumatoid arthritis, you get a lot of infiltrating neutrophils, okay? And these neutrophils start chucking out free radicals. Now, the idea behind this is that, you know, if we if we launch an inflammatory response, there is some horrible pathogen around, okay? So we'll poison it with free radicals is the idea. Uh, but of course, there is no horrible pathogen, so instead the neutrophils just end up poisoning all the healthy tissue. And this leads to the destruction of the synovial joint. Okay, uh, so potentially this 5-amino salicylic acid works to have its anti-rheumatoid effect by mopping up the free radicals that the uh, neutrophils release. Okay, so that's uh, all I have to say about sulfasalazine. It is a very effective anti-rheumatoid drug. Okay, in the next video we'll turn our attention to penicillamine.